Okay, in Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7, Paul said, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be known to God, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard, guard your heart and your minds through Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you today for today. Thank you for this morning's service. Thank you for people that made decisions. And Father, I thank you for just showing up and being our preacher and our teacher. Father, we praise you, and I thank you for these folks that are here tonight. You be our teacher again, and we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. In our last study, we talked about, in Galatians 2.20, Paul said, Christ lives in me. And because of these three consuming desires possessed his life, he wanted to know Christ, to live like Christ, and to make Christ known. And so Paul said, that's my whole life. He said, "Those those are the goals that I have for my life, and that is to know Christ, to live like Christ, and to make him known. So therefore, according to this passage of Scripture, the goal of every believer ought to be conformed to the image of Christ. That is, our character should be the character that reflects Christ. And we talked about that this morning, (laughs) so I don't need to go any further. So tonight I want to divert your attention away from the Apostle Paul to a man by the name of John the Baptist. John the Baptist is, uh, is an individual that all of you are aware of the fact that was Jesus' first cousin. You know, his, his, uh, Darren talked about that this morning. Uh, so John the Baptist, Jesus was first cousin. And so, uh, uh, and Paul talks about the characteristics that show up in John the Baptist's life. And you could think that while Paul was teaching, you could see in your, in your sanctified thinking, imagination, you could see an artist sitting there listening to Paul and drawing a a picture of John the Baptist. And so uh, at one time or another, I I think maybe every one of us in the religious realm have probably thought about, I maybe even said, I wonder who was the greatest preacher in the world. And we would have all kind of answers, you know, it would either be uh, Billy Graham or Chris Well or one of the uh, um, guys, that, the brothers that started Methodism, or could it be uh, some of these other preachers, that uh, Martin Luther that broke away from Catholicism. But Jesus tells us who he is. In Luke chapter 7, verse 28, Jesus answered that question this way. I tell you, of all who have ever lived, none is greater than John the Baptist. Then he goes on in that same verse to say, yet even the least in the kingdom of God is greater than he is. Well, that seems like a contradiction, you know. So let's see what Jesus is talking about here. The the exact interpretation of that latter phrase is open to some considerable debate. Depends on what preacher you want to talk to or what theologian you want to read. Some think to mean that if, if you're, if you're, uh, standing in grace in the kingdom that you have a distinct advantage over John the Baptist who was outside the kingdom and was merely at, at, uh, would not be able to, to understand the fullness thereof until uh, the eternal state. And others believe it's in reference to the humanity that Jesus referred to in Matthew chapter 18 verse 4 when he said, so anyone who becomes as humble as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So regardless, now I, I personally probably buy into the first part more than I do the second part, but, but they both tie together. You can't, you can't believe one without believing the other. And why preachers want to separate those makes no sense to me whatsoever. <laughs> because I believe that, that because uh, the Old Testament saints and, and up until there were the day of Pentecost, when we had the birth of the church, then they were outside of the kingdom. And, uh, and, and because they believed in the coming of Christ, John the Baptist announced his, who he was, uh, until they could believe on him, they still were not a part of the church. They were still a part of the Old Testament. They were a part of God's chosen people in the Old Testament. 
So regardless of how you choose to interpret that portion of the verse, it in no way diminishes Jesus' extraordinary praise of John the Baptist's ministry. John the Baptist was truly the greatest of all the prophets. I mean, Jesus made that clear. There's no no reason to doubt that. But as you study the Word of God, uh, uh, and you study the life and ministry of John, uh, you find out that in John chapter 10, verse 41, about the ministry that most people never seen. The people made this amazing observation about John the Baptist after Jesus talked about how great he was. John performed no sign, but all the things that John spoke about this, about this man, was true. The King James Version says, John did no miracles. He never raised anybody from the dead. He never fed a hungry crowd by multiplying bread and fish. He never walked on water. As far as the Scripture is concerned, he never healed any sick bodies. He never cast out any demons. And he never turned any water into wine. That's why the Bible simply says John did no miracles. And yet Jesus said, of all who have ever lived, none is greater than John. Now that's interesting. Uh, that's interesting to me. I was, I was young in the ministry, but I was in New Testament uh, when we, this thing came up. And I, and I was totally confused. I thought, why in the world would, would that, you know, it just didn't make any sense to me. Of course, I didn't know anything about the Bible anyway. So not much of it made sense to me. So, so you would think that maybe Elijah who closed the heavens and it didn't rain or Daniel who was peacefully slept in a lion's den or, uh, and singled out for that arm. Maybe it was Moses who parted the Red Sea or Elisha who raised the widow's, woman from the de- uh, widow's son from the dead. But no, that wasn't that at all. Jesus said the greatest prophet that ever born was John the Baptist. Well, then what on earth did John the Baptist do that would evoke such an overpowering uh, elevation from the Lord of glory? Well, here's what he did. Are you ready? He preached about Jesus. Now, you would figure that preachers could just kind of grasp that, you know? If you want to hear about what problem the world's got just turn tv on they'll tell you you know and if you turn enough of channels they'll all tell you a different thing that's pretty amazing to me you know but but and if you want to know what's in a magazine buy the magazine but if you want to know about jesus you ought to be able to come to church and if that man is standing in the pulpit is not talking about jesus he ain't got no business standing in there isn't that true i mean I, you say well preacher you you kind of hard dogged about it. yeah i'm i'm just about as stubborn as a bulldog when it comes to preaching Jesus and preaching out this book. You know, he stood up and he faithfully preached that there was one coming after him who would be the Savior of all men, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John was no miracle worker, but mind you, he was just a preacher who talked about Jesus. He never alluded to him. As far as we know from the Scripture, he never alluded to Jesus as his family member, he alluded to him for the position that meant most in his life, and that was he was the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sin of the world. Now, in light of all of that we've said so far concerning John the Baptist and his ministry, uh, I, I, I want to talk about some things. First of all, I think some things that we can, can glean from what Jesus is saying here is this. I want you to notice that service is always superior to signs. Now, I want, you to, I want you to wrap your mind around this. Service is always superior to signs. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm saying here. Because I believe in miracles. Because I believe we serve a miracle-working God. And all of us in here are one. Amen? All of us in here are miracles. However God used to, to work a miracle in your life, if He never did another miracle in your life, He gave you the miracle of salvation. Amen? So on the other hand, because we live in a world that is almost totally obsessed with the thrill 
of the unusual and the lure of the spectacular, the first point of this lesson in our present day Christians may be have a hard time accepting what I'm saying. We are much like the unbelieving crowd who followed Jesus. Many in our churches today are shouting, show us a sign, do us a miracle. We're always looking for the new and the alluring. Are y'all listening to what I'm telling you? We're always looking for something new, a new feeling, a new high, a new something. Let me tell you something. Service is always superior to signs. In the midst of this carnal craving for a display of the flesh, old time service has been relegated to the back of the class. Are you listening to me? People want something new and exciting. They want, the, they want their funny bone tickled every Sunday morning, you know. And so most folk want to be a part of a miracle. They want to see visions, but they're not willing to pick up the phone and invite somebody to meet them in front of the worship centers to be at church on Sunday morning. Let me tell you about this morning. I was coming up the steps and there was a guy that I know that lives on the other side of Bethlehem. Lives right over there where uh, Dennis Smart and uh, the Gillens and all, all in that area. <clears throat> and when I came up the steps he was standing there talking to me, waiting for me to get to the top of the steps. And he said, I, I, do you have any more, uh, now that, I want you to, before I tell you this, uh, he said, do you have any more of your testimonies. I said, yeah, I got some. He said, I need about 10. I said, okay. So Linda went over. I said, why are you up there? Get Dale about six or eight or whatever because he's got to give them to his Uncle Ralph. And so uh, the guy that I'm talking about is a retired state trooper. And he told me, he said, I had already given him 10. And he said, I've given them to every, I'm mailing them to every state trooper that I had a relationship with. He said, I've sent uh, five to Georgia, and I've sent the other five to troopers in the state of North Carolina. And he said, I had to give mine to another guy that he knew that lived in Raleigh. He said, so I don't have one. I said, okay, take one of these and uh, do what you need to do with them. And so he said, uh, I said, what are you doing here? He said, well, a friend of ours that was a helicopter pilot for the uh, state troopers out of Raleigh uh, moved up to Morganton, and I told him that he needed to come to Mountain Grove Church and that me and my wife would meet him here. And I said, well, his wife's named Linda. I said, where is Linda? He said, she's standing outside waiting to meet them outside because I told him we'd meet him at the door. <laughs> so when they came in, he brought the guy down and introduced him to me, and I went back and introduced myself to his wife and told him I appreciate them being here. And the guy made this statement. He said, we're only here because Tim told us to come. Now, guys, listen to me. Service is always greater than signs. You can't replace a, some kind of a sign with loving somebody enough to stand out in the cold to meet them in front of the church to make sure they have a place to sit out and feel welcome. You know what I'm saying? So don't, don't get those things uh, mixed up. So what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say John the Baptist had no miracles to qualify his ministry. He had no signs and wonders which he could point to in his human pride. He just faithfully preached about Jesus and thanked God for the reckoning of the master who thought he was one of the greatest preachers of all time. It hasn't changed a bit today. And that's why we need no great miracles. No mighty works, no dark, mysterious experiences to qualify us to be servants of God. We just need to get busy. We need to get out there. There are some people out there, ladies and gentlemen, that are hungry for, for the Lord and don't know what to do. They don't know. They, they, they're actually afraid of this, this big old place. And, they, you know, they, they've heard so many horror stories anyway. And they've got to find out from somebody that, that, that has been here. You know, Ralph's uncle... I mean, the Dale's uncle Ralph 
I'm, we were eating at the uh, uh, Olive Garden the other day. Wasn't it the Olive Garden? Yeah. We were eating at Olive Garden the other day. I got up to leave, and uh, somebody hollered at me, and it was Ralph's uncle, uh, uh, Dale's uncle Ralph. You know, I'm going to get it mixed up in a minute. It wasn't Dale eating at the Olive Garden. It was his Uncle Ralph. And he had a whole table of, of other old cartridges with him right up there. It's about, I, he's, Ralph, but not, he's not old as I am, is he? Is he? Well, yes, yeah, see, he's just a young chicken compared to me. And uh, so they were all sitting over there, and he hollered at me. And he came over there, and he said, uh, uh, I want you guys to meet, meet a, a great man of God right here. And I'm thinking, who, there's somebody here that I, he wanted me to meet, you know. And he said, uh, he was introducing me to all of them. And one of them with him was, had been to Thunder Sunday. Uh, he was another one of those old, I may, all of them might have been Harley Riders. I don't know. And uh, Ralph said, uh, I need a favor. And uh, I said, okay, what you need? So <laughs> he looked at this two across the table because the guy that had been to Thunder Sunday had one. He said, do y'all have a CD of this preacher's testimony? And they said, no. He said, you will before next week is over. So he said, preacher, can you get me another six or eight testimony CDs? I said, yeah, I'll pick you up, Ralph. And, uh, and, 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 you know, none of those guys come to church here. You know, and Tim Talton doesn't come to church here that invited that couple to, to come here. And uh, so he... he Ralph told me, he said, I'm going to give y'all one of these CDs. Now, you, Ralph, is, he's, he's about as clear-cut as a buzz saw. He said, I'm going to give y'all one of these CDs. If I find out you're not listening to it, we got issues. And I'm thinking, <laughs> okay, Ralph, whatever it takes, son, you know. <laughs> so, but anyhow, the, what happens is you don't have to be a miracle worker to be able to share the good news of Jesus Christ. There are a lot of people hurting out there, guys, and they just need somebody to love them and to know that we care about them. And that's the greatest ministry that you can ever have. We, uh, we had a stewardship committee meeting this afternoon, and we talked about, we talked about our income and our attendance, and, our, and somebody made, a, made a, a statement in the stewardship committee, well, why is our attendance down? I said, it's been down, but it's slowly but surely easing back up. And, uh, and they said, well, what happened to it to go down? I said, it was the new and the spectacular. And I said, I can name you family after family after family that left here to go to Elevation Church. Most of those people have left Elevation Church. I can tell you family after family that left here to go to, uh, to um, Water Life. And most of those have left water life. I can tell you a bunch that left here and went to Whitney Pentecostal. And some of those people have left Whitney Pentecostal. So you, what are you saying? Now listen to me carefully. I want you to get this. If you're looking for the spectacular, your flesh is never going to be satisfied with the spectacular. Your flesh always wants more. It always wants more. But if you're looking for Jesus, find you a church that preaches the word and exalts the Lord of glory Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. And if that's what you're hunting, I promise you, if God will give me the courage and the strength, you'll never be disappointed in Mountain Grove. And so, <coughs> they don't, don't substitute the, um, the service for, for a miracle. The second thing that I want to tell you, and now, now I'm going to make me hurry now, is this. Position is preferred over performance. Position is preferred over performance. By almost any system of evaluation you want to see, John the Baptist wasn't a very good performer. He lived in the desert. He ate weeds and locusts. And uh, he wasn't much. On the scales of Madison Avenue, he would have come up a zero. But not only look at that, Look at John's preparation for service. If you're going to a church today, you better have a, a resume about that long. You got to have at least that many schools, and that many. They got, you have to have so many degrees they'll call you a thermometer. You know, I mean that. You just, I mean, churches are looking for, they are looking for somebody 
that that they that's so and so and so and so. See, when when this church read my resume, they they saw that I had two doctorates. Lord have mercy, son, we need to get that joker. Mm-mm, they changed their mind. <laughs> some of them changed their mind after about one year, and some changed after about three years. And, <coughs> and the rest of you are still thinking, Lord Jesus, what have we done? But John didn't have any of that. He was ridiculed by the scribes and the Pharisees. He had, they had nothing he could, he could boast about from the flesh. From a purely practical standpoint, John the Baptist was a man of little ed- or no education. No, John the Baptist was none of those things we look for today. He had no place of prestige, had no personality, he had no promotional gimmicks, he had no formal preparation. But thank God he had something that was vast superior to any of those, and he had position. Wow. He had come to the place of recognizing that the only thing mattered in his life is to do what God wants him to do, and that is to exalt the Lord of glory. I'm going to tell you something, guys. We got the greatest position in the world today. We are the children of the living God. Whatever the world is trying to do to destroy the church, whatever Satan is using to try to bring this church down or any other church down, let me tell you something. We have a position in God that the world and Satan cannot take away. And that's pretty awesome. So position is better than, uh, than purpose. So when all of Jerusalem came out and bowed at his feet, John said, I'm not Christ. He said, John made this statement. He said, I must decrease and he must increase. Isn't that good? He said, listen, there's one coming that I'm not even worthy to to tie the the shoelaces to his shoes. That's pretty awesome. And in commenting on John's unswaying loyalty to his position, Jesus said in Luke chapter 7, verse 24, what did you go out into the desert to see a reed shaking in the wind? What a tremendous compliment that was. It was the Lord of glory talking about John's steadfast commitment. He said, the grass blew away, but the weed still stood. It was still standing tall. He said, John was stability. He was a man of stability. How desperately we need for people today to understand the difference between position and performance. How desperate we need to learn that lesson today. For we have too many people in our churches that we cannot distinguish between the two. As sincere as they are, those misguided Christians and misguided preachers mistake unknowingly mistake activity for anointing, business for blessings, and promotion for power. And so they work hard and they perform well. And Jesus gets the leftover. But you see, the blessing from God will, has never been on, on, on performance alone. Jesus said in John chapter 15, verse 5, He that abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. Abiding in Christ is a matter of position and has nothing to do with performance. Performance is but an act of the human will, energizing the flesh, void of faith and completely barren of spiritual fruit. Performance moves to the realms of time and to the desires of people. It strives, it pushes, it shoves, and it competes. But that's not so with position. See, position is anchored in trust. It rests and it overcomes. It is sincerely anchored in the all-sufficiency of Christ in whom dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. John chapter 1 verse 12 said, But as many as received him to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Child of God, it is in his willingness to love you and to care for you and direct your life that makes us in the position that we're in today. How did we get there? By performance? No. By service? No. By all of these other things? No. We got in the position that has been sovereignly bestowed upon us by simple childlike faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Oh, John the Baptist. Mm-mm-mm. <laughs> he wouldn't fit in our churches today. 
Mm. That's right. You know what? I'm glad God let me be your preacher. Lord have mercy. 